This video is going to show you how you can create a train station departure board for a model railway. This will be controlled by a Raspberry Pi. The OLED display I'll be using is 0.91 inches diagonal. At G scale, which is where I'm looking to use this, that would be about 52 centimetres, which is a reasonable size for a small station platform site. For double O, that's about 166 centimetres, which would be a fairly big sign but not unreasonably large. There are quite a few limitations to this size of board in terms of only being able to display three lines of text, but otherwise it's quite practical. I'll be using a custom train departure schedule, which could be synchronized with model railway automation for train arrivals and departures. But you could show real departure times if you want to use this for a practical use. As well as the Raspberry Pi aspect, I'll briefly show you how I created the display stand, which I designed in FreeCAD and 3D printed. The video is split into chapters, so you can jump to the appropriate part of the video as necessary. You can also get links to my website and file downloads from the description. If you want to see more of these kind of projects, then please subscribe to my channel, and if you give the video a thumbs up, that would be a great help. As I said, I'll be using a tiny 0.91 inch OLED screen. This is based around the SSD1306 OLED driver, which can be used for different size screens. This one, a tiny monochrome screen with an easy to read display, which can display text or monochrome graphics. The screen has a resolution of 128 by 32 pixels. These are available mounted on different boards, some using I2C and some SPI. This version is on a very thin PCB with the I2C connector pins at one side but other suppliers have these mounted on boards with the connectors underneath and possibly mounting holes. For this project, you'll want to use the same as I've used, although you could use one of the larger displays if you wanted a large display board, perhaps in a large waiting room or similar. Unfortunately, the ones which are based on this size are all I2C, or at least as far as I could find. I say unfortunately, as whilst I normally prefer I2C over SPI, one of the disadvantages with this OLED display is that it has a hard-coded I2C address, preventing using multiple independent devices. One thing to be aware of with these displays is they're made of individual organic LEDs. These will deteriorate when used over a long period of time, so they may not be the best choice for displays that will be constantly switched on. Adafruit warn of some deterioration after about a thousand hours with a pixel switched on. But based on another video, then whilst there is some deterioration after 10 days running, 24 hours a day, they were also still usable after almost a year running constantly. For a model railway with an average use, that should be last quite a good time. If you have a permanent railway display, then these are cheap enough to replace on a yearly basis if you need to. I'll include a link in the description to a video showing the tests. It's in Russian, but includes English subtitles. One other thing is that it may deteriorate more when exposed to water, so this may be an issue with an outdoor railway. I'm going to see how well it lasts, and I'll add details to my page if appropriate. These have an I2C interface, which needs just four connectors to the microcontroller, or the Raspberry Pi in this case. These are usually clearly marked on the PCB that the display is mounted on. I've already created another video that explains about the I2C protocol and how to use that with the Raspberry Pi. The driver board has a fixed I2C address. In this case, the address is 0x3C. This is quite frustrating. If it had a user configurable address, then you could connect multiple independent displays on the same I2C port. I may look ways around this in the future, but for now, it means you have to use a Raspberry Pi or a microcontroller for each unique display. If you don't need the displays to be independent and you want multiple screens showing the same information, then you can do that, such as having multiple platforms on a single station. This diagram shows how the Raspberry Pi is connected to the OLED display using I2C. I've used a breadboard for the connection, as this allows me to use my own pull-up resistors rather than relying on the weak pull-up which is on the Raspberry Pi. I've used 3.3 kilo ohm resistors here. Note that the position of the pins on the OLED display does vary between different display modules, so you should follow the labelling of your display rather than rely on the order shown on this diagram. If you want to add more screens, then just connect them to the same bus. 
but note that as they use the same address, they will display the same output. There may also be a problem with both devices responding to their status at the same time, but it did work correctly when I tested with two identical displays. Now we can move on to configuring the Raspberry Pi. The first step is to ensure that I2C is enabled on the Raspberry Pi. This can be done by going to the Raspberry Pi configuration tool. I'm using the graphical version here, but if you wanted to configure it from a terminal session, you can use sudo raspi-config. I'm going to click on the interfaces tab and I2C and just enable that. Now we can check to see if it can see the device. You can do that by using the I2C detect tool with minus Y and 1. This will scan the SM B bus, the I squared C bus one. And as we can see, it's shown here as 3C. So we can code that as 0x3C, and that's what we're expecting because that's the address that's on these devices. If you have a really old Raspberry Pi, then you may have to change that to bus number zero uh, because it used different pins on the older version. If you don't see anything on either of those, then you may just need to check your wiring. And so that should work. So for this, I wanted to use Python. The library that's used to communicate with the device is from Adafruit, and they previously created a standard Python version, but that's no longer developed. Instead, I'm going to use one which is based around CircuitPython. And CircuitPython is Adafruit's version of MicroPython normally used on microcontrollers, but this can also be installed on the Raspberry Pi. And what this means is that you'll need to install the CircuitPython libraries. This is not a problem, but it does mean you need to write the code in CircuitPython interface format rather than standard Python. And there's also some other examples of code that are available on the internet which use C or C++ if you prefer those. So before we install the libraries for the display, we need to install the Adafruit CircuitPython library. Now, we're not actually going to install the MicroPython interpreter. We've already got a Python interpreter, which can do even more than that. But we're going to install the libraries that allow us to communicate with the hardware as though it was using CircuitPython. So first, we'll just quickly check that the operating system is up to date. So sudo apt update, we'll just check the repositories to see if there's a newer version. This is a, a recently installed image and I did do the update, so I'm not really expecting anything here, but we'll go through this anyway. It's a useful thing to do every now and again. Okay, we've just had a timeout against one of these don't know why I'm not concerned about this at the moment. Like I say, I've got a, a recent update. But it has said there's some packages that can be upgraded, so we'll install those. So that's sudo apt upgrade. I should do those. Now that we know that the operating system's up to date, we can check that the PIP3 and setup tools that are used by Python are also up to date. So I'm just going to use PIP3, install, and upgrade the setup tools. So these are tools used by Python. So PIP3 is the uh, tool for installing Python libraries. I'm not sure why it gives that count uninstall um, message, but the important thing is that it's successfully installed setup tools, so that's fine. Now we can install the Adafruit Python shell using 
should be there. Pip3 install. And now we can download the script that's provided by Adafruit, which is going to install and set up CircuitPython. It's called Blinker, which is uh, just the name that Adafruit's given to this. So you're going to use wget, which is a command line, sort of a web browser. So it downloads individual files. Uh, you don't have to remember this, I'll put the details on my website and in links in the description. And then we're going to run that as a Python 3 ex executable. What we're doing at this point is we've downloaded a script and then we're running it with root permissions. So it's running as an admin user. You should only do this if you trust the code that you've downloaded. A good thing to do is either view the file and see what it's doing, or it's down to whether you trust the source. In this case, it's coming from GitHub and it's from the Adafruit repository, which I'm happy to trust. So I'm just going to use this. Now, if you're default Python is set to 2.7 or Python 2, which is what the Raspberry Pi is at the time I'm creating this, then it will upgrade or switch that to version 3. And you need to agree to that for it to proceed with the setup. Now that that's complete, we need to reboot. So just reboot the Raspberry Pi. Now rebooted, and you'll note that the default version of Python is now set to Python 3. So if you Python minus D, you'll see my particular system is Python 3.7.3. .3. If you did want to change it back afterwards, um, perhaps you've got some program that you rely on that only runs on Python 2, then you can change that back using sudo update alternatives and as well as config Python. And as you can see, it will allow you to choose which interpreter will be used as default. Uh, we'll just leave that for now. Hopefully you shouldn't need to do that. Python 3 is is the standard version now. Python 2 is already end of life um, and has been for over a year now. So hopefully anything that is essential should now have been updated to work with Python 3. So this shouldn't cause any problems. But there's that option if you do need to undo that change. That now we've got CircuitPython installed, we can add the Adafruit library for the SST1306, which we do using pip3. And then next we're going to install the Python imaging library known as PIL, P-I-L. And this will be used to create an image object for the text and then we'll be able to display that image onto the screen. <laughs> 
looks like that's already installed on this system so that should be a problem so now we're going to look at some files that I've created that are going to demo this and so we're now we've set up our environment we just put these in a folder called departure and we're going to start with the test display open up in Thony So I'll just quickly go through this. I'm just going to increase the font size here because some people I know prefer this to be a, a bigger font size when shown on my videos. Hopefully you should be able to see that. So this one's just called testdisplay.py and it's just going to show how you can create three lines of text and display that on the screen. I'm using the Sony editor as it's the default for the Raspberry Pi but you can use any Python IDE or text editor that you want. So if I just quickly go through the code, we'll start at the beginning and you'll see that it imports board and the digital I.O. These are the circuit Python implementation of the MicroPython machine. Uh, it's an alternative to GPIO0, which you might use on a Raspberry Pi normally, or the Python I2C library, which is SMBus. Uh, instead, we need to use these specifically for circuit Python. It also supports the Python image library mentioned earlier is used to create an image that is sent to the screen and then of course we need the library to communicate with this screen so this is the Adafruit SSD 1306 now the the screen I'm actually using isn't an Adafruit model but uh, Adafruit do use this uh, same chip to drive their some of their OLED displays and they've provided the code that we're going to use Uh, the width and height are defined, which is for the screen, and this one's 128 pixels by 32 pixels. If you've got the larger display, displays, that might be 128 by 64 pixels or something like that. Creates an instance of the I2C uh, class and then passes that to the SSD 1306. Note that it's specifically referring to the I2C here. There's also an equivalent of this that can be used with SPI as well. And it's got the address 0x3C, which is what we saw earlier. And this is going to be called the OLED object. Created an image which uses the Python imaging library, which we'll see a bit, and then a draw object which is uses this image. So this is going to be what we're going to draw the image on, so we can use the draw tools. We've loaded a font, just the default font, and then we've just got some variables here with the text for the lines. I've used the font get size to get the size of the font. This will be useful if you need to know the length um, because the font width will be of whatever text object so it's the full length of text one um, but I won't be using that here I'm just using this for font height. Now I do already know that this will be font height of 11 because that's the, the small font that we're going to use but it's a way you can find it out here and, and you can use that in the code and then we use the draw which is, is what we created here 
and then we run the text method and give it coordinates, the start position. So this is the top left hand corner, the text that's going to be on. So we give it the text one variable, the name of the font and fill equals 255. So that's going to be filled in white. Now this is a, only a monochrome display. Then we do the same for text two, but instead we've increased the uh, Y position by the font height. So we've moved down to the next line. And again, there, there's no extra space in between these, but this just works well and, and means you can get three lines of text on the screen. And then we have to display the image by sending the image to the OLED display and then calling OLED.show and then you'll be able to see this is the output we get. So that code when run shows three static lines of text on the screen. That's just a, a demonstration so you can see how to start coding in this. Next, I'll show you how you can make a more realistic looking train departure message. So for this, I've decided to create a simple message with a scheduled time for the next train. And it has the scheduled time on the left, followed by the destination and then the ETA, which for the moment will be set as the scheduled time. I'm not going to put in intentional delays or anything at the moment. I've then used the second line to show the subsequent train. In the code, I'll refer to this as a future train. And the third line will show the current time centered on the display. It will just show the hours and minutes. To make the times appear to be realistic compared to the current time of day, then I'll always set the next time a set delay from the previous train, and a future train a set time from the next train. Each of these will have different destinations. This looks relatively convincing when you look at the screen compared to the current time. It would not stand up to proper scrutiny. I'll talk about possible improvements later. So now I'm going to open the improved file, which is called departure display.py. It uses much of the same code, but then I've added some additional features. So the additional library I've imported are the time and date time, which we'll be using to show the time and date. I'm going to set various destinations. I've just used three here, made up places, Shedditch, Camp Hill and Waterdown. And that's a Python list. The next destination, which is the one shown on line one, will be index zero, so we'll show shed itch. And the future destination, which is going to be line two, is number one, which is Camp Hill. And then these will cycle through as we go through the code. I've put the time till the next train, and this is in seconds, so this is going to give three minutes from when one train leaves till the next one's due. And the following one is going to be 610 seconds afterwards. And that's just over 10 minutes. And that just makes it look a bit more of a, a realistic time than if we had it three minutes save, which is perhaps a typical time to go around the circuit. I'm storing the start time for just basically just put in today's date and time into the next time variable. And as you can see, I've just replaced that um, detection to, with with a fixed font height of 11. 
and the rest of the code is now put into this while loop which will handle updates and then rerun. It first clears any existing image by creating a black rectangle that at 0, 0, full width and height of the screen fill 0. And then checks to see if the departure time has been reached, in which case it moves on to the next train. And it creates the tri time for the next train and updates the next destination and future destination positions. And then it outputs these to the screen one line at a time. I've used these as three separate uh, calls of the method, the text method, so that I can line these up. So the scheduled departure time will always be starting at the very left hand side. The, des the station for the destination will start at pixel 33 and then the estimated time of arrival will be starting at pixel 98. Line 2 is pretty much exactly the same but I've now increased the y dimension y position to reflect the height of the font and using the future time and the future station. And the third time is just showing the time on the screen. And to format that, I've used time dot the string format time, just to put hours and minutes at the moment. And it will work out the width and height of the font, and then use that width to determine where the center of the display should be, so how far it needs to be moved along on the x-axis. Now I've split the draw text over several lines here. That's exactly the same as if that was just one big long line. Shows the image as before and then finally it sleeps for 10 seconds before repeating the loop. Here you can now see the display that's showing the next two trains and the current time. You can see how the time changes when the next train departed. This is the 3D printed stand that I created for the display. It's approximately to scale for my G-Scale railway and it's designed using FreeCAD. It's very loosely based on a real departure board but it's a bit simplified, just to make it easier to print on a standard 3D printer and to help with making sure that it's weatherproof. I started with a rough sketch and then I created this in FreeCAD. I made a mistake calculating the dimensions when I first did this, so that some of the dimensions I entered are a bit out. The main thing is I added about 10 millimeters to the horizontal dimension. I amended these later, so if you download the files from my website or from Thingiverse, they should be correct. I'll just run through the 3D design quickly so that you get an idea of how I designed this without making this video really long. It should give you an idea of the different parts I made. I've already created a video with a beginner's guide to FreeCAD if you're interested in learning FreeCAD for beginners. <laughs> 
One of the things about the OLED display that I bought is that it already had header pins soldered on. For many people, I'm sure this would com be considered a good thing, as it means you can get started without needing to do any soldering. But in my case, these are too big to fit in the 3D printed case. I therefore had to remove the headers and solder wires on. I used a desoldering tool, also known as a solder sucker. You first heat up the solder with a soldering iron and then use the desoldering tool to suck up the solder. I would have preferred for these to come with no pins and to have to solder them on, but I can see why some prefer the pins to be pre-installed. With the pins removed, I then soldered new wire onto the display. I needed quite thin wires to be able to feed them through the stand. My standard wire was too thick, so I used wire that I stripped from some spare ethernet cables I had. Another alternative is removing the internal wires from burglar alarm cables. I crimped connectors to the end for testing purposes, but I'll be looking at soldering or similar when this is actually deployed. Other ideas are different ways of displaying the departure times and possible integration into my other model railway automation projects. For example, instead of the time changing at a set interval, it can be synchronised with the departure of the train. Another idea would be to have a scrolling display showing the intermediate stops on the train route, with the end destination at the top and the other destination scrolling across. I'd also like some way of being able to add more than one independent display. This could be achieved by using multiple Raspberry Pi computers, but I think it would be better using a different microcontroller, perhaps having a Raspberry Pi Pico that acts as an I2C peripheral for the Raspberry Pi, which then acts as a controller for the screen. I hope that's been useful and perhaps given some inspiration for how you can use OLED displays in your own Raspberry Pi projects. If you like the video, then please give it a thumbs up and share so that others can get to see it. I'll be looking at other projects using the Raspberry Pi and other microcontrollers in future, so please subscribe if you haven't already. I look forward to seeing you on a future video.